It is the 20th anniversary of the first clinical use for cardiac resynchronization therapy for heart failure. And that is also the topic of the review topic of the week in the September 9th issue of Jack. And I'm with the paper's first author, Francisco Leva, who is uh, MD from the Center for Cardiovascular Sciences at the University of Birmingham, UK. First off, 20 years of CRT. You really do take it from, from bench to bedside. I, congratulations, it's, it's a, fun, a fun paper to read. The history of this is kind of interesting. They really didn't, uh, when this came out 20 years ago, the whole concept of changing pacemakers was kind of scary to most doctors. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's quite interesting to go back even to the pre-CRT era, actually. Uh, even as far as 1925, we have uh, evidence from Wiggers uh, that stimulating the myocardium in an abnormal fashion, ectopic stimulation of the myocardium, uh, would give rise to an untoward mechanical effect. And it wasn't really until imaging came up in the uh, late 1980s that uh, there was a clear link between disturbances of interventricular conduction and the uh, mechanical response of the ventricle. And really that led to the invention of uh, CRT, uh, Morton uh, Mower, uh, and through various uh, very small studies, uh, mainly on the part of engineers, a collaboration between engineers and clinicians, that CRT was born, but you're right, I mean, there was a, a great deal of skepticism uh, to begin with in the early history of CRT, um, but the whole process has culminated in randomized controlled trials, and really as a therapy which uh, is, uh, has been uh, very good and continues to be very good. Well, you had two very distinct groups. You had electrophysiologists, you had heart failure docs, and never the twain shall meet, at least 20 years ago, it wasn't that, that common, now they had Suddenly they had, well, they were thrown together. That wasn't very smooth, was it? <laughs> no, very smooth at all. And uh, I mean, things are changing for the better. And uh, the, there is quite a lot of uh, um, uh, cross uh, um, linking between uh, the specialties. But you're right. I mean, at the beginning, uh, electrophysiology in the 1960s, 70s, 80s was really very isolated within a hospital. It was a very niche specialty. Um, and heart failure was hardly born. Uh, so those two specialties are now really converging and uh, we still have to work harder really in order to make the treatment uh, more widely available to, to patients. What was the part of writing this that you most enjoyed? Was it the history element? Was it yeah. kind of summarizing the whole 20 years? What was it? I think really is to, to see what the history of a therapy is, how it was born, uh, whether it was discovered by chance, uh, or where, what knowledge we had uh, beforehand. And there is a clear thread actually between experimental work, animal work, in the, you know, as far as, as long as, uh, uh, as long ago as uh, 1925, we see evidence of this. And then that matured into the correction of uh, intraventricular and interventricular and AV disturbances leading to a therapeutic benefit. Uh, and the invention was, was very clever indeed, actually. I mean, in the very early years, it was only people with very severe heart failure who were probably next up for heart transplantation. Now we're talking about moving it to a, a much milder heart failure population. Sure. I mean, it's, it's natural in, in the history of developing a treatment to, to deal with patients who have had conservative treatment, standard of care, and then are resistant to that care, and then we build in the new therapy. That's the case for most therapies, and it's natural to, to think about treating disease early. And it makes perfect sense to correct interventricular conduction defects um, beforehand, uh, before you develop the, the picture of heart failure. And in fact, the latest studies are very consistent with that. It makes perfect sense. Um, so uh, we're now looking at uh, treating patients who are not symptomatic uh, with uh, both CRT and defibrillation. Another paper in Jack coming up is taking a look at clinical trials and where we really still need to make some major improvement and one of the criticisms is we don't have enough data clinical trials on devices. This is one of those areas though I think where we do have quite a bit of data with CRT. Is there still some information missing that you, you think is very necessary? I think so. I think we've entered a new era on refining CRT, which is in a, in a way a slightly crude technique uh, which has remained virtually unchanged since uh, Daniel Gra uh, implanted the, the first transvenous uh, um, uh, CRT device in 1994. 
Um, and that consists of uh, placing the left ventricular lead where you can allow the left ventricular free wall. There's now emerging evidence that placing the lead outside scar tissue. Uh, some limited evidence to uh, indicate that if you target areas of latest activation, you may get a better response that needs more work. Um, and there's various other um, bits of work, uh, all converging upon the notion that we should be more careful as to where we put the lead. There's also a lot of work using automated AV algorithms um, uh, to, to, to again do synchronization uh, by the device rather than by echocardiography, which has not really been proven very useful. So I think the new era of CRT is along the lines of uh, refining implantation and refining um, device uh, automated um, um, uh, synchronization. Well, among the various changes in Jack recently, I really do like the reviews of the week. They, uh, they are always interesting papers to look at in the September 9th issue, 2014 of Jack. Please take a look at this one. It is the 20th anniversary of CRT. For CardioSource World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.